Hello, and welcome to this special edition of Knowing Neurons. I'm here with Botan Roska from the Friedrich Meister Institute for Biomedical Research. And he studies the visual system all the way from the retina to the brain. So, Botan, let's talk a little bit about your research. Can you tell us what are the main questions in your lab, and how are you trying to answer them? Yeah, so there are two main questions. Uh, one question is that, how circuit elements in the visual system compute visual information. And the second is that how can we use this knowledge to help patients who are suffering in visual diseases that lead to blindness. So what techniques are you using to answer the first question? So we use a variety of techniques. Conceptually, we use electrophysiology and imaging to read out activity of neuronal cells while we stimulate with light the visual system. And then for our manipulations, we use mostly optogenetic and genetic manipulations. So we use viruses and transgenic mice to bring in tools to specific cell types and then modulate them with a variety of genetic tools. Wow. And how about your more translational work? In the translational work, we use a gene therapy, a new form of gene therapy. This is we call optogenetic therapy. So we use optogenetic sensors to try to target into cell types in the retina, with which then try to rescue vision or bring back visual activity to a blind retina. That's great. How about for your presidential lecture that you're giving at SFN on Monday, November 17th? What are you going to speak about? First, I will talk about our circuit studies in the retina and the thalamus and, and the cortex to show how local circuit compute information, visual information. And then second, I will talk about a work in which we try to understand photoreceptor cell biology. What is the mechanism that keeps the light-capturing apparatus of photoreceptors in good shape? And then I will show then how can we use this sort of understanding to build uh, retinas from embryonic stem cells which are functionalized, which are light-sensitive. So you're looking at the visual system circuitry in the retina and then separately from thalamus to the cortex? Yes. My, most of my work up to, let's say, a few years ago was in the retina. And a few years ago, we also started to study the uh, thalamus, which is the station when retina sends information, and then and the entry level, entry size of the visual cortex where the thalamus sends information. Okay, so I'd like to ask you some questions about how you got to your current position. So, yeah, how did you get to where you are today? Mostly randomly. Well, you know, I have done a lot of things in my life, and <laughs> sort of every turn was somewhat random, somewhat planned. So I started my life as a cellist, uh, as a musician in Hungary where I grew up in Budapest. I was music academy there, and then I get an accident, so I had to stop it. And so there I had to think what I will do, and I chose to study mathematics and medicine. And after finishing medicine, I was not sure I want to be a medical doctor. So I got very interested by the work of Hodgkin and Huxley that brought me, who used mathematical modeling and recordings, and that brought me to neuroscience. So I started a PhD in Berkeley where I studied retinal circuit physiology. I enjoyed a lot my time, and I thought that I stay in research. But I also thought that the techniques or the approaches at that time were not adequate to really manipulate the system, to perturb the system. And I was fortunate to become a Harvard Junior Fellow, where I could do a sort of freelance science around different departments. And I was studying genetics and virology under the guidance of Konicepko, and then on the other side of the river, Marcus Meister helped me. So put together this, this knowledge at the end, I, I learned about viruses and genetics and physiology. And then I thought that I'd like to use all this then to understand the visual system. And the, I get a position here in Basel in Switzerland. And this is what I started to do. I started to combine the two. And since I'm here and uh, <laughs> enjoying combining these different techniques to understand and to manipulate the visual system. So you didn't always want to be a scientist, but once you started... No, not at, all. not at all. It really came at the end of medical school where I, that I would be interested and I might try out. 
So it sounds like grad school was kind of a pivotal moment for you. Was there a favorite memory during that time in Berkeley? Yeah, I really enjoyed. At first, I have to say I really, really enjoyed, and I enjoyed tremendously two things. One is my conversation with my advisor Frank Werblin, and the second one is my conversation with the Retina. This is what the place where I realized that for me the way to do research, at least at that time, was that I don't read too much, I don't you know ask people too much. Instead, I record a lot from the Retina while I stimulate them with different light patterns. I did it for five years, almost every day recording, and really the retina taught me everything about itself. And I just found it remarkable, and I still think that it's the best way to do research is not to ask people, but ask the brain. So is that the piece of advice you would give to young scientists today? Very much so. So listen to the experiment and not your colleagues. So how much of being a successful scientist do you think is luck and how much do you think is hard work? I think both is required. And I think hard work is very important. But also I would say it's only worth to do it when it's really a passion, when hard work does not seem to be hard work, but it seems to be very hard not to work. I think that's how I live my life. For me, that's what I love to do is to work. I get very nervous when I go to vacation. After a few days, I already think that there is something missing. And luck is also needed because uh, at one point, you know, we are searching and uh, <laughs> luck is important. But I would say that, that if somebody working very hard and goes to laboratories where there's a lot of excitement, then there's a higher chance for luck to happen. Do you think that having a good mentor plays a big role in your success? Yes. But I also think that there are many different ways to be good mentors. So what is a good mentor for one person might not be a good mentor for another person. I think there is a, it's really a match between two people. All right. So let me ask you, just switch gears a little bit, some fun questions. So is there a neuroscientist you admire today? Yes, of course, there are many I admire, uh, but particularly I like to mention David Hubel, who passed away very recently. He studied and he discovered with Thorsten Wiesel the structure of the visual cortex, and I was fortunate to sit close to him every Monday while I was a junior fellow at Harvard, and I learned a lot from him, and I admired not only his science, but also the way he looked at science and the way he lived his scientific life. What do you mean by that? Because he was so passionate about it? And also, he just cared about the experiment. He went in every day, he did the experiment, and went home learning something. And the next day he came back, and again there was an experiment. He lived from experiment to experiment. And I think that this is really what I, I like. Now I, I don't do experiments myself, but I really, really enjoy looking at the experiments and thinking about new experiments. Yeah, absolutely. The new data is the most fun part about science. That is absolutely right. So if you weren't a neuroscientist, what would you be doing? Well, I would likely be doing mathematics. But I would be barely sure that if tomorrow they tell me that I have to stop neuroscience, I would do mathematics. I'm very interested in mathematical logic, which is a little Mm -hmm. bit abstract and quite far away from neuroscience, but that's that's one of my passions. Do you get to do that at all? I do. Usually every day I do an hour of proofs in mathematical logic. (laughs) Wow. This is my uh, morning running. I have to say that that also I'm, I'm not working anymore with my hands in the lab, so I mostly sit and talk to people and look at data and think. So now we are to the lightning round. Coffee or tea? Uh, Coffee. Go to comfort food? Well, I'm not sure I have a comfort food. So. <laughs> What's your favorite food? My favorite food is uh, Asian kitchen. What's your favorite place in the whole world and why? It's my room. That's where I usually sit and think. That's my favorite activity. To sit and think. And what dead person would you most like to meet or get advice from? Bertrand Russell. He is a, he was one of the founders of mathematical logic, an incredible person. Probably that would be my favorite meeting. 
Well, thank you for talking with me and answering all my questions. It was a pleasure to talk to you. You too. Okay, bye-bye. That was Botond Ruska speaking to me from Basel, Switzerland. We look forward to hearing his presidential lecture at SFN this year. If you have any burning questions about the brain, leave us a message or tweet us at Knowing Neurons.